Welcome to Going Deeper. My name is Marcy Sklove, and today my guest is Frances Crow. Frances has been a stalwart activist in the Pioneer Valley since 1951. She is 97 years old and continues to fight against war and for social justice issues, even today, even last weekend, in fact. Her memoir is called Finding My Radical Soul, and uh, that was published in 2015, and we'll be hearing about that as well. So welcome, Francis. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, I am still trying to wrap my mind about your being born in 1919, and I was thinking about all of the historical events that have happened uh, in your lifetime. So I wanted to start there and just ask you to highlight some of the memories mm -hmm. that you have mm -hmm. of world events. Well, I don't have memories that early. Sure. But my mother did, and she uh, said she took me to the first demonstration. I think it was when women got the vote. Wow. And she just had great expectations for women and their lives mm. after that. And uh, she was a feminist, and uh, my father very much supported her yeah. and felt strongly that women should have all the rights that men had. Yes, that's, that's really yeah. great. Speaking about your early life, I loved this quote um, in, the, in the beginning of your book, you say, 1919, the year I was born, ushered in a decade of prosperity and optimism. The last shots of World War I, called the, quote, war to end all wars, exploded only months before my birth. And the fact that I grew up in a small Midwestern town at the end of World War I shaped me in ways that continue to this day. The atmosphere surrounding my childhood fostered a strong anti-war feeling. I remember my mother telling me about this first march that you just described to us. So you're, you know, you grew up in Carthage, Missouri, and you had a really wonderful sounding childhood, I, I read in your memoir. But um, in the background, what were some of the issues going on? Not even when you were little, but when you were in college and World War II and all of that. I think classism, it was still the issue. And uh, my family, uh, were from the working class mm -hmm. background. Uh, my mother grew up on a farm, yeah. and uh, she went to school, high school. She didn't go to college. My father, although he came from a family, New Englanders who had all been ministers, they went to Williams College, and then uh, they followed at Yale, Theological Seminary, hmm. and they became teachers for a while until a ministry opened up for them. Oh. So that they felt, uh, but his father left all of that when he married an Irish woman. Oh, yeah. And I think that affected their going out to Carthage yeah. and where he bought some land that wasn't very good taught in the local school and struggled uh, yeah. to uh, find his place. But, you know, he, he was a hard-working businessman, mm -hmm. and uh, they had a vision of a better world for, and they had four daughters. Yeah. And so that they really wanted something better for us. Yeah. 
One of the memories that I read about that impressed me was this um, execution that was going to happen when you were five years old and your father was pretty outraged, it seemed, that they wanted to give out tickets so people would watch the execution. And that made a big impression it, on you. It did. You know, as I walked downtown with my mother, I think once a week she went shopping mm -hmm. in town to see what was new. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw this fence going up around the jail. And I said, where are they putting up the fence? And she said she didn't know, and she kind of directed the conversation to other things. Yeah. Uh, but I have heard my father talking that night to a neighbor as they watered their gardens. Uh, he, the neighbor said, was he, my father, was he getting tickets to go to the execution? My father said, no, never. And he kind of moved away from the, that part of the garden. Yeah, yeah. And I asked, you know, I wanted to know more about it. But it was a black man who yeah. was being executed. In fact, you know, now I went online, I could Google and get the story and yeah. really check that that was true. So was this, if since you looked it up, was this sort of, they had gone through a, a legal court system, I'm or was not it a sure. lynching? I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I mean, yes, he'd been, uh, you know, sentenced to execution. Yeah, yeah. So. Wow, that, that sounded really very intense for a, a little girl to, to have that experience. All right, so moving forward, uh, I wonder what are some of the big issues that you worked on through the years? And of course, the draft was a big one. Well, the war, you know, war in the beginning was the issue. Yes. After World War I, people were talking about how terrible it was. I remember having a conversation at dinner uh, once with my father when I said, you know, I would support anyone who would refuse to go to war, would refuse to c kill. My father said, you wouldn't have done that if you had been alive at that time. He said, we all sacrificed. Why, well, he said, we had brown flour, mm. not white flour. Huh. As if that... <laughs> Right, that was the sacrifice. And so, you know, I said, well, I would support anyone who refused to kill. Mm -hmm. Now, where that came from, I don't know. About how old were you that when you would... I think I was about seven. Wow. And so, you know, it yeah. was... Yeah, I picked up someplace that it was wrong to kill mm -hmm. and hung on with that. And then uh, people were, you know, was growth was coming and people were getting more sophisticated. And mm -hmm. they, um, I remember two episodes that my father uh, you know, told me about when the YMCA mm -hmm. came for him to, for his annual contribution and they wanted to up it, and they were s establishing a summer camp uh, down in the Ozarks, and he, they came to ask my father to make a special contribution hmm. for that, and I, he said, you have to open the pool for girls. I want my girls to learn to swim. All right. And so that, uh, they actually did open the pool from six to eight in the morning, uh, I think. And uh, we had to get up very early to have breakfast an hour before right. you go in the morning. Oh, wow. Then we walked down to the Y. But we all learned to swim oh, and got our lifeguard status. And actually, I went to the summer camp 
And so that, to me, was wonderful. And my sister, my older sister, mm -hmm. also went, but she got homesick and wanted to go home. So I said, can I have her two weeks to yeah. stay two weeks longer? And they, it's, so yeah. I you know, kind of defined myself very mm -hmm. early. You know, the second can be that person. If the first is obedient and good, then we're free to be ourselves, I think. Right, right. And when uh, the first demonstration I ever saw was in Carthage, when all of the ministers in town were vigiling in front of the high school because they wanted to put in ROTC, mm -hmm. Reserve Officer Training Course. And I didn't understand. I said, what's that really about? And they said, well, uh, we could get a, a new gym for the boys if we have ROTC. And we're opposed to ROTC. And I said, well, can the women have the gym that you're the old gym. not using? <laughs> then for, I said, you know, they didn't have uh, exercise classes of any kind for mm. women in those years. Right. And so they said, well, we don't know. And I went to the principal of the high school and I asked him, why don't the women have gym? And he said, well, uh, uh, why don't you p uh, write a petition and circulate oh. it and bring it back? And that was a good thing to do. Yeah. And so I, I drew up a petition with some help from him, and it circulated. I think I got something like 400 signatures. Wow. And from a small high school, there was something like 70 people in my graduating class. Huh. And I took it, so he said, bring it to the school committee when they meet, which I did. And they said, it's a very good idea, and thank you for your work, but alas, we have no money. Hmm. And these, you know, these were the emerging issues, how yeah. we were going to, you know, adjust to the demands of women, right? right. I think. And <laughs> wow! And in that process in high school, you learned so much about how you protest and how you do a petition and how you bring it to the school board. That's wonderful. Yes, and I think I was the president of every group I belonged wow. to in high school yeah. at that time. People could see that I was pushing yeah. and was willing to push. That's so, great. And, you know, as they were trying to keep us in our place, mm -hmm. uh, I rode my bicycle to school. Yeah. I didn't see why I shouldn't ride a bicycle. And uh, they were the... the boys mm -hmm. would stand out in the front of the high school and make fun of me. And I remember once I got my bicycle tire caught oh. in the trolley tracks that went out Main Street. And I fell, <laughs> and I was so, you know, oh. it didn't matter whether I was hurt. I was so embarrassed, embarrassed. Oh. that I had fallen yeah. in front of these boys that my father said after that, keep your bicycle down at my store. So oh. I would ride another two blocks to the square where my father had a plumbing and heating business. Yeah. And he let me keep my bicycle there so that the boys wouldn't make fun of me. Oh. So Francis, <laughs> I, I want to, shift gears a little now and talk about some of the important work that you've done around um, the draft and the anti-war movement for the Vietnam War. Uh, I am skipping ahead, I realize mm -hmm. that, but I think it's so important to hear about how you touched so many individual young men's lives. 
Can you tell yes. us about well, that? I was interested in, because I had a younger son who was approaching, you know, the age of 18 or registering, and we were Quakers mm -hmm. then. We had become Quakers. And I felt that, uh, you know, I needed to know more about what the options were facing him. Yeah. And so I went off to Philadelphia and took a training course, a weekend course in draft counseling. And I came back and I was studying the law very carefully, which said anyone who is opposed to participation in war in any form facing them mm -hmm. on moral, ethical, or religious grounds is qualified to be a conscientious objector. So I felt, you know, it, you didn't have to be a Quaker right. if you could be moral or ethically uh, opposed if you held it with the same degree of intensity as one would hold a religious belief right. that you qualified. So I decided to set up draft counseling. And I wondered, you know, then we were sort of into the group model that people were uh, working in uh, consciousness raising groups. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want every, everybody who's opposed to war and trying to figure out what they're going to do to come to my house on Tuesday or Thursday afternoon or Friday night and we'll sit in a circle and I will say, what is it you object to? Mm -hmm. And out of that, I felt they would come to a, a realization of kind of who they were and where mm -hmm. they were going with their lives and why. And uh, so I had an old mimeograph machine. I did flyers. And oh, first I went to the Gazette and I said, would they put in an ad? And they said, no, it's against the law what you're doing. And I oh, said, no. it is not. You have to talk to your lawyers. So they called me back a couple of days later and they said, you know, we can put it in and it's not against the law. So I don't think anyone ever read this. Mm. They want it goes down and the yeah, they hit it one ads. Buried it, yeah. And um, so I decided when the kids got off to school, I would take these flyers and talk about that described what I wanted to do and when I where I lived and we're just where I still live. Yeah. And I went, and that was before uh, students were allowed to have car, car, uh, cars, and there was no public transportation. Right. Everybody picked up hitchhikers. So I went down on Route 9 by the Coolidge Bridge and yeah. gave, you know, got a lot of young men in the car and drove to, Amherst, and I did that all day until about three o'clock when I finished wow. up. And but you know, people would get in the car, and I would say, "What are you doing about the draft?" And I would push. You know, I drove slow and talked <laughs> fast to post and sent back the flyers. And the next day, I had a room full. And I, after that, I never had to advertise. Wow. I always had a room full. Nobody went. Everybody who came, you know, decided they were conscientious wow. objectors. So one year we had 1,196, 95, I think, people who came. Hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it was really uh, gratifying work. Absolutely. Because once they got the classification and they didn't go and they did alternative service sure. if they passed the medical exam. But I felt that it was enriching for them that they didn't, if they 
uh, lied about, you know, went to a psychiatrist and got mm -hmm. a letter, mm -hmm. they would often question whether or not they were really uh, sane. And if they had misinformation uh, about their health, maybe it was would increase sure. their um, health coverage. Uh, it, well, it's know, like this was a more truthful I approach. I wanted them to be truthful. To themselves. And yeah. to be honest with their conscience. Yeah. And so that it really did, uh, I feel, enrich them and help them to act on their right. conscience. That's what I loved about it. It wasn't just, oh, I'm going to help you get out of this thing, no. but really to find out how you feel about it and what your your values are. And, and study the law. And study the law. Well, we're, um, yeah, we're moving into that again, that kind of studying the law again, but not yet. I don't want to go there yet. Mm -hmm. um, Tell us about all of the civil disobedience. I'm just, as a general thing, you know, that's a big deal for a person to say, I'm ready to go to jail again and again, and not just go and get bailed out, but actually spend time yes, in prison. Yes, I never paid a fine, mm -hmm. and I did only once alternative service, but I never will again. But you know, our Shut It Down Affinity Group, that we had a group of women, older women, who took on Vermont Yankee. Yeah. And I was arrested 11 times in five years there, I think, and went to court only once. Mm -hmm. But we finally shut it down. It's now, we still have work to do because those spent fuel rods are sitting oh. up there on uh, open uh, casks and uh, spreading the radioactive isotopes all over the area. And they should be put in dry casks deep wow. underground. But, you know, the, the corporations don't want to spend the money on that. so. That's a big problem. Yeah, yeah, that is a big problem. Um, another thing that really touched me in terms of looking at your memoir mm -hmm. was how mo film and media and your fight to get democracy now, you know, tell us about the, the media aspect of your mm -hmm. political work. I think I've always felt, you know, that media was a way to take people right into it. And when we were working on uh, ending apartheid in South Africa, and I got this film on called Last Grave at Dembaza, mm. which was very powerful. It showed the white um, society versus the black society in South mm. Africa. and. I went to uh, President Br Bromley, who was at um, UMass then, and I asked him if our affinity group working on uh, ending apartheid could show it to the trustees. And he said, well, the only free time would be at lunch. And if you appear, with the film and the projector and the screen and everything, he said, uh, we can ask them if they want to watch it while they're having lunch. And so I gathered everything together and managed to get there, although it was a little hard because Janetta Cole, who had told me about the film, was then teaching in New York. And she got up early and took it down to the bus station oh, in New York and put it on the bus coming to Northampton. So I was at the bus station waiting for it. 
and the bus didn't stop. And oh my gosh. I said to the dispatcher, why didn't the bus stop? Oh, she said, no one was getting off or getting on. So I said, where's the next stop? And she said, Greenfield. So oh. I drove as fast as I could to Greenfield and got the film up oh. that bus, drove back to Route 116 yeah. to Amherst. I drove right across the lawn uh, 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 over to Memorial Hall where wow. the trustees were. You know, I think I learned that you do what you need to do. That's right. And the way opens ahead of you. Wow. And when I finished showing you the film, you know, Bromley said, you know, does anyone have any question? And someone said, what will we do if we can't get good investments that are not in fact? He said, then we will get another investment advisor. Wow. And I loved it and because it was the first university to divest. From really? Yes. UMass was the first? But the first one. In the whole country? Yes. Oh, my gosh. And after that, you know, I felt, the film is the way. And that oh. night I went to a meeting of the uh, Mount Toby Peace and Justice Committee and I was telling them, they said, and one of the women on the committee said, I will give you the new money to buy a copy of that film <laughs> yourself. <laughs> Which then we showed all over the valley. Wow. But I found film, um, wonderful way of really taking people into the issue. Yeah. And I've still, we show films sure. twice a month oh. now at um, Forbes Library on Wednesday nights at uh, 6.30. In Northampton, and, yeah. And we showed a film last night on the mm. um, Civilian Peace Corps and I think we had 29 people who Wonderful. came. So, <laughs> so that's still a very effective tool. Very effective. And, yeah. you know, I just feel that people like Amy Goodman, mm -hmm. you know, who are alternative uh, news, the War and Peace Report, the way she carries yeah. on Monday through Friday yeah. with you know, her message is so important. And in the beginning, I couldn't get anyone interested. Yeah. But I put up a tower in my backyard, and, you know, I just felt I had to broadcast right. it. Right, and now yeah. Amherst Media is one of the places where it's shown daily. That's great. Yeah. And it's making a difference. A huge difference. So. Francis, we're going to have to close for part one, and I really look forward to talking to you in part two about the current situation. We just had our election, and we have a new president, Donald Trump. But for now, we're going to close, and uh, we'll be back for part two. Thank you all Thank for, you. for joining in.